Most physical systems are pretty complicated, and some of them are chaotic, so that little changes or disturbances in the starting conditions may have enormous implications later on. One such system is the weather. Before modern weather forecasting came along, it was anyone's guess what the next day would bring. Meteorological satellites, accurate instruments on the ground, and high-speed computers have revolutionized the accuracy of forecasts out about a week or 10 days. But beyond that, even the best forecasts using the finest technology run into the combined problems of chaos and complexity, including the butterfly effect, the notion that the tiny air currents caused by a butterfly flapping its wings might eventually be amplified so that it becomes a hurricane. Even with all this complexity, it may seem that no matter what the phenomenon, whether it's the toss of a coin or the global weather system, the same underlying laws of nature are involved, and those laws are deterministic. The universe, so it was once believed, is like a giant clockwork mechanism, fantastically elaborate, yet ultimately predictable. Two issues, however, stand in the way of this claim. The first harks back to complexity. Even within a deterministic system, one in which the outcome depends on a series of events, each one of which is predictable, knowing the exact preceding state, the whole problem can be so complex that there's no achievable shortcut allowing us to see in advance what will actually happen. In such systems, the best simulation, for example run on a computer, can't outpace the phenomenon itself. This is true of many physical systems, but also of purely mathematical ones, such as cellular automata, the most famous example of which is John Conway's Game of Life. The evolution of any given pattern in life is entirely deterministic, yet unpredictable. The outcome only becomes known when every step along the way has been calculated. Of course, some patterns that do the same thing over and over again, such as oscillating back and forth or moving unchanged after a certain number of steps, are predictable after we know their behavior. But the first time through, we don't know how they're going to behave. In maths, things can be unpredictable even if they're not random. But until the turn of the 20th century, most physicists held the belief that even if we couldn't know every detail of what happens in the physical universe, we could, in principle, know as much as we wanted. If we had enough information, then, using the equations of Newton and Maxwell, we could figure out how events would unfold, to whatever level of accuracy we chose. The dawn of quantum mechanics, however, saw that idea fly out the window. Uncertainty, it transpires, lies at the heart of the quantum realm. Randomness is an unavoidable fact of life in the subatomic world. Nowhere is this capriciousness more evident than in the decay of a radioactive nucleus. True, observations can reveal the half-life of a radioactive substance, the time taken on average for half of the original nuclei in a sample to break apart, but that's a statistical measure. The half-life of radium-226, for instance, is 1,620 years, so that if we started with one gram of it, we'd have to wait 1,620 years for half a gram of the radium to remain, the rest having decayed into radon gas or lead and carbon. Focusing on one individual radium nucleus, though, there's no way to tell if it'll be among the 37 billion nuclei that decay in the next second in one gram of radium-226, or whether it will decay in 5,000 years' time. All we can say is that the probability is a half, the same as flipping heads or tails, that it will decay at some point in the next 1,620 years. This unpredictability has nothing to do with shortcomings in our measuring gear or computing power. The randomness at this fine level of structure 
is inherent in the very fabric of reality. As a result, it can affect phenomena and thereby introduce randomness on a larger scale. An extreme case of the butterfly effect, for example, would be the decay of a single radium atom influencing the future weather on a large scale. It may well be that quantum randomness is here to stay. However, there have been physicists, and Einstein was famously one of them, who couldn't stomach the idea, to paraphrase Einstein, that God plays dice with the universe. These opponents of quantum orthodoxy favour the view that behind the apparent quixotic behaviour of things at the ultra-small level, there are hidden variables, factors that determine when particles decay and such like, if only we could learn what they are and be able to measure them. If the hidden variables theory turns out to be true, then the universe would again revert to being non-random and true randomness would exist only as some kind of mathematical ideal. But to date, all the evidence suggests that on this question of quantum indeterminacy, Einstein got it wrong. In the looking glass world of the very small, nothing it seems is certain. What we took to be solid little particles, electrons and such like, dissolve into waves, and not even material waves, but waves of probability. An electron can't be said to be here or there, but only more likely to be here than there. Its motion and whereabouts governed by a mathematical construct called the wave function. All we are left with is probability, and even that's not an easy concept to pin down. There are different ways of thinking about it. The most familiar is the frequentist point of view. In this, the probability of an event happening is the limit of the proportion of times the event occurs. In the case of an idealized mathematical coin, flipping heads has a probability of exactly a half because the more the coin is flipped, the closer the proportion of heads approaches the value a half. A real physical coin doesn't have a probability of exactly a half of landing heads for a number of reasons. The aerodynamics of the toss and the fact that, in the case of most coins, the head generally has more mass than the pattern on the other side bias the result ever so slightly. The outcome also depends, to some extent, on which side is facing up before the toss. The probability is roughly 51% that the coin will land the same side up as before tossing, as during a typical toss it's marginally more likely to turn an even number of times in the air. Sometimes, such as for an event that can only occur once, the frequentist way of working out probability is useless. An alternative is the Bayesian method, named after the 18th century English statistician Thomas Bayes. This bases its calculation of probability on how confident we are in a certain outcome. For instance, a weather forecaster may talk about a 70% chance of rain, which essentially means that they are 70% confident that it will rain. Where differences between the Bayesian and frequentist viewpoints get especially interesting, though, is when they're applied to mathematical concepts. Think about the question of whether the trillion trillionth decimal digit of pi is 1. There's no way in advance of knowing what the answer is, but we do know that once it's been figured out, it won't ever change. We can't repeat a calculation of the digits of pi and get a different answer than the first time it was done. The frequentist viewpoint, therefore, implies that the probability of the trillion trillionth digit being 1 is either 1 or 0. In other words, it either is or isn't a 1. Supposing pi were to be proven normal, the Bayesian viewpoint would state that the probability now is 0 0.1. But the probability after we calculate that far, if we ever do, will then be definitely either 1 or 0. Now, the actual trillion trillionth digit of pi won't change at all, but the probability of it being 1 will change, precisely because we have more information information is crucial to the Bayesian viewpoint. 
While the Bayesian approach may seem subjective, it can be made rigorous in an abstract sense. For example, suppose you had a coin that was biased. It could be biased by any amount from 0% heads to 100% heads, with each value equally likely. You toss it once and it comes up heads. It's possible to prove that the probability of a head on the second toss is two-thirds using Bayesian probability. However, the initial probability of a head was a half, and we didn't change the coin. The Bayesian viewpoint says that while the first head will not directly affect the probability of the second head, it gives you more information about the coin that allows you to refine your estimate. A coin heavily biased towards tails is highly unlikely to flip heads and a coin heavily biased towards heads is much more likely to flip heads. Taking a Bayesian approach also helps avoid a type of paradox first pointed out by the German logician Karl Hempel in the 1940s. When people see the same principles, such as the law of gravity, operating without fail over a long period of time, they naturally assume that it's true with a very high probability. This is inductive reasoning, which can be summed up if something x is observed that's consistent with theory t, then the probability that t is true increases. But Hempel highlighted a snag with induction using ravens as an example. All ravens are black. So the theory goes. Every time a raven is seen to be black and no other color, ignoring the fact that there are also albino ravens, our confidence in the theory all ravens are black is boosted. Here though is the rub. The statement all ravens are black is logically equivalent to the statement all non-black things are non-ravens. So if we see a yellow banana, which is a non-black thing and also a non-raven, it should bolster our belief that all ravens are black. To get around this highly counterintuitive result, some philosophers have argued that we shouldn't treat the two sides of the argument as having the same strength. In other words, yellow bananas should make us believe more in the theory that all non-black things are non-ravens without influencing the belief that all ravens are black. But that suggestion has been criticized on the basis that you can't have a different degree of belief in two different statements if it's clear that either both are true or both false. Maybe our intuition in this matter is at fault and seeing another yellow banana really should increase the probability that all ravens are black. Adopting a Bayesian stance, however, the paradox never arises. According to Bayes, the probability of a hypothesis H must be multiplied by the ratio probability of observing X if H is true over probability of observing X. If you ask someone to select a banana at random and show it to you, then the probability of seeing a yellow banana doesn't depend on the colors of ravens. The numerator the number on top will equal the denominator, the number on the bottom. The ratio will equal 1, and the probability will remain unchanged. Seeing a yellow banana won't affect your belief about whether all ravens are black. If you ask someone to select a non-black thing at random and they show you a yellow banana, then the numerator will be bigger than the denominator by a tiny amount. Seeing the yellow banana will only slightly increase your belief that all ravens are black. You'd have to see almost every non-black thing in the universe and see that they were all non-ravens before your belief in all ravens are black went up significantly. In both cases, the result agrees with intuition.